So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this regular um, webinar series hosted by Infostrux. Um, so before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that we uh, make heavy use of the Q&A feature during those events. So uh, if you have any questions that may come up uh, during, the, during the presentation, uh, I invite you to put it in the Q&A section. I will be uh, keeping an eye on it um, and either bring it up during the, during the talk uh, if it's relevant or uh, at the end during the Q&A uh, section of the presentation. So, um, I mean, without further, further ado, I am very happy to introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, it's a man who has been instrumental to Infostrux's success so far, and uh, he is generally a pretty great reference when it comes to everything Snowflake expertise. Uh, so I give you Jim Ketcha, a partner sales engineer at Snowflake. Jim, if you want to take it away. Thanks, Pierre. Um, once again, my name is Jim Koch. I'm a partner sales engineer at Snowflake. Been here a little over a year, but before that, I was actually a, Snow, a customer of Snowflake all the way back in 2015. So I've been working with the product for about six years now and um, have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about Snow, uh, Snowflake and specifically some updates and announcements that we've had uh, within the last couple of weeks and months here, specifically to help developers expand what um, they're able to do inside the Snowflake platform. So as we kind of talk about Snowflake, I just wanted to do a quick background and kind of talk about the evolution of Snowflake briefly. For those of you that may be new to Snowflake or new Snowflake as the data warehouse. Well, back in 2015, that was true. We started with one region in AWS on the West Coast of the United States, and we were built for the cloud, the idea of separation of storage and compute, the idea of near zero maintenance and per second billing. All of these new ideas and concepts that was introduced with the architecture that Snowflake really brought about back in 2015. Move forward to 2018, 2019 started to expand not only to more regions, but really the three major cloud providers as well. Along with that, expanding to workloads outside of the data warehouse, including data lakes and data engineering, data applications and data science. Um, our architecture and our customers finding new use cases and ways to go about using the Snowflake platform to really meet their business needs and get the most value out of the data. And then move forward to this year and where now it become the data cloud, the idea of bringing a data platform and data content together across your ecosystem, really driving a true frictionless world where now producers and consumers of data go to the same centralized live copy of the data instead of doing things such as FTP and APIs and some of the other traditional ways that companies went about sharing, exchanging, and utilizing data assets, not only internally, but across their organization. And when I talk about the data cloud, I wanted to just give you a quick representation of, of kind of what that means. In this diagram here, what we have are dots representing Snowflake customers, with the lines represent sharing activity that's going on between those customers. And this is back in January of 2021. This represents about a 400% increase in stable edge cases that our customers are using the data cloud to collaborate for monetary reasons, for efficiencies, a variety of different ways that they're going about exchanging and, and really sharing live centralized copies of data on the Snowflake platform. And while this is impressive, I want you to take a look now, just seven short months later of what the data cloud has become. And you can see it's really exploding. Not only our marketplace, where we now have over 400 data sets on our public marketplace, but large institutions and companies throughout the world building their data cloud on top of Snowflake. And you see some of the examples here, all the way from COVID-19 to financial data to software companies utilizing the power of the Snowflake data cloud and our platform to really think of the possibilities that were not possible just a few short years ago. And what makes the data cloud possible is the combination of our platform and our content. And for today's purposes, I'm gonna be focusing more and really specifically on the platform for developers, but I did wanna show these elements and really how Snowflake is changing the way organizations think about using their data assets and really the strategic direction that we're headed and the progress that we've made in just a few short years. 
With the data platform itself, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it is a combination of things much larger than just a data warehouse, including data lakes, application science, sitting on that common platform. No longer the need to take 15, 20 different services and try to put an architecture together. The same governance, the same security model, the same pricing model, consistent across all three of the major cloud providers across a variety of regions throughout the world. And if you really look at what Snowflake defines as a true cloud data platform and some of the requirements, the reason those workloads can happen in one environment is because of the architecture. The ability to have one platform with one copy of the data with many workloads, secure and governed access to all data all the time. Near zero maintenance. It's simply not enough to pick a database up on a and move it to the cloud and call it a cloud data warehouse or a cloud data platform. Really the, the ability for a platform to handle a lot of the administration and overhead is critical to becoming efficient and optimizing your data platform. And then ultimately unlimited performance and scale, paying for what you need when you need it by the second, not only vertically, but also horizontally as users can spike from a few dozen to a few thousand users and being able to handle that type of, of uh, workload instantly. The ability to not have to worry about storage capacity and planning for that, knowing that Snowflake is gonna be able to be elastic and grow with your needs. And when no longer deleted, be able to shut down or purge data and no longer have to pay for it without any additional overhead or work on the company or the organization standpoint. So with that, I'd like to jump into a little bit more about some data areas that we've announced here recently and really the benefits that it's going to bring and expand use cases that developers can interact with the Snowflake environment. This is, is kind of a quote, and, and we're hearing this time and time again from our customers, but we now have the ability to do the art of the possible. It's opened up. It's no longer infrastructure that's to constraint. It's more of the imagination of an organization because now we're making programming and using of data much easier, much more flexible, and, and, and in, in an environment that security officers and, and governance is, is front and center all of the time, uh, allowing organizations to have the confidence to move these additional workloads to Snowflake. Most of the time I'm gonna be talking about Snowpark and our Java functionalities, but I will be talking a little bit about unstructured data, SQL APIs, and a new program we started called Powered by Snowflake, which allows organizations to take advantage of building applications and knowing they're going to have Snowflake support. So as I start, one of our biggest announcements that we made at our summit in June was Snowpark. And Snowpark, it now allows developers to work in the tool of their choice and the notebook of their choice inside of Java and Scala and later in the year Python. And what Snowpark allows users to do is essentially develop in their notebook and have all of that logic pushed down and operated and performed inside of the Snowflake platform. Previous to Snowpark, a lot of this work to develop in these languages had to be extracted out of, out of Snowflake and then pushed back in to fully utilize. With the advancement and now the announcement of Snowpark being uh, publicly available as of two or three weeks ago, we now have the ability to open up the abilities of our platform to developers outside of just SQL or having and requiring them to pull data out of the Snowflake environment. And we do this by taking that um, functional languages and loading libraries, which allow it to convert into SQL. And here's an example of a simple data frame that's, that's generated. And what Snowpark does is create the equivalent SQL to that statement and execute and push that work down into Snowflake. So now the ability to process millions or even billions and trillions of rows inside of a notebook can be done without that data actually being retrieved and brought back into the environment, allowing the power of Snowflake, allowing the governance of Snowflake, allowing the security of Snowflake to really manage all of that workload and, and all of the other requirements around managing data of that size. And if I give you a, a, an example that I showed to customers and partners, here's just a simple example of how easy it is to use Snowpark. Um, at the top here, I've imported three different libraries that I've brought into the environment. Then I create a, a, a statement in Scala and then execute it by uh, running this inside of my notebook. What's happening behind the scenes now is Snowflake is converting that statement into a SQL statement, pushing it down, in this case, 
running a query over 61 million plus records, but only returning the final count back to Snowflake. And this is going to allow for those, those developers that choose to work in, in, like I said, languages such as Scala and Java to really now have a much easier environment to interact with this data and not actually having to do stuff in SQL and or be on the Snowflake platform directly. They're able to use these tools that they're comfortable with, that they're efficient in, and they're very productive in. The second announcement that was significant at our summit was the announcement of Java UDFs. And with the announcement of Java UDFs, we're able to deploy JAR files directly into a Snowflake stage and build and compile user-defined functions over that JAR file to be able to run models now that have been rendered inside of Snowflake. No longer the need to pull the data out to run through these models and then return back. These models can be run directly inside of Snowflake through these JAR deployments. And what Snowflake does behind the scenes is instantiate JVMs on our warehouses that are running. Um, as those of you who are familiar with, with Snowflake, warehouses come in a variety of sizes, all the way from extra small up to soon 6XL. And each one of those represents the number of nodes used behind the scenes to process the, the data requests. And for every node that sits on a warehouse, we will instantiate a JVM to be able to run and, and, and execute these workloads through these JAR files to get increased performance and, and to be able to be able to get more work done in a shorter amount of time with our per second pricing model that we have in the Snowflake platform. And here's an example of that, a simple example using a, a, a natural language jar file that's been deployed on top of Snowflake. What we're doing here is, is compiling that over a UDF and then able to use that function in a SQL statement. In this particular one, we're passing a string in there and the, the jar file is then looking at the content of the string to determine whether the information is a person, a place, or a location, or I'm sorry, an organization. And while this is a simple example, you can kind of think about the possibilities and now that can be done inside of Snowflake with the data never leaving Snowflake. All of this work is done inside of the platform using all of our security and governance uh, um, uh, processes that we have put in place and, and no longer the need for, for this data to leave Snowflake also opens up a lot of possibilities for business analysts and others inside the organization who previously couldn't or had a difficult time accessing this type of uh, logic. They're now able to incorporate it in their SQLs and their BI tools and their ETL tools to really take full advantage uh, of these, this work done outside of, of other parts of the organization and really allow the entire organization to benefit from its use. And, and combining these two together really becomes a powerful message and, and really functional data engineering in Snowflake, where now we're allowing developers to develop in their notebooks, to write code in the language of their choice, able to take jar files that have been generated and deployed out there and use them inside of the Snowflake platform. Snowflake then will then take those, those, that, that data frame, that execution, that language written, convert it to SQL, it will understand if these Java UDFs are referenced in there and then only execute it and run it at the times desired to actually run results, either bringing back subsets of data back to the notebook and or processing data such as, as creating or inserting data into tables inside of the Snowflake environment. Once again, not requiring that data to ever leave Snowflake unless the desired code is asking it to be pulled back and be painted back to a user screen. And, and where some of the benefit comes, not only in the functionality, but as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the speed, where now when you're combining Snowpark and processing billions of rows and combining that with UDS, where we're processing each record uh, individually, the ability to scale not only vertically, but horizontally inside of Snowflake and getting the same workload done at a comparable price point by using larger warehouses and, and really being able to execute and, and operate in an environment that's right for each organization. And not only for each organization, each team, and even each team member with inside of a, a, a given team, because of the ability that Snowflake has to separate storage and compute and the compute resources not to have to contend with each other, really gives uh, uh, these new features and functionalities 
a lot of ability to do things that developers struggled with or were not possible in the Snowflake environment previous to these features being released. Along with Snowpark and Java UDFs, we've also announced a number of other tools that will help developers as they uh, start to work more and more in the Snowflake environment. And one of them is unstructured data. We're currently in private preview right now for this and expect it to go in uh, public preview uh, shortly. But uh, now, not only the structured and semi-structured data like JSON in their raw formats, but now the ability to store pictures and voice and other unstructured um, data objects inside of the Snowflake environment. And with that comes the, the governance and the security and the ability to run SQL on top of these data sets not only to get metadata back about the unstructured objects, but now running external functions to run APIs against the data or using the Java UDS to get information out of there. So you can think of the power of potentially like pictures on a menu being captured and, and having some type of machine learning evaluate those pictures and return labels and information in a structured manner directly inside of Snowflake to combine with all of your other data assets and opening up unstructured data to a lot more users in your environment that previously, like I said, do not have the skill sets or had the access to that data and expand really what potentially they can do in their organizations, in their departments with this new ability inside of Snowflake. Another feature that is now in public preview that, that was announced last month was the ability for developers to start using APIs inside of Snowflake. And um, this is, is a new REST interface for submitting all SQL statements. And it's for those, those organizations that for whatever reason can't load drivers or it's just a developer's preference. Uh, and, and they're looking to migrate other applications into Snowflake. This is gonna make it much easier, much simpler, and is really one that's gotten a lot of excitement from our customers that um, will now be able to start doing things via an API that they had been hoping to do for, for quite a bit inside Snowflake. And now it's becoming a reality with the announcement of this feature being publicly available. And the last feature for developers that I wanted to touch out that's gonna be coming soon is uh, stored procedures and Snowflake scripting. Up to this point, stored procedures were written in JavaScript. And for those organizations moving off of uh, traditional databases such as Oracle and SQL Server, um, we're gonna be announcing the ability to run stored procedures and this, this functional language inside of stored procedures using SQL. Um, it's in private preview right now. We're expecting to become in public preview later in the year and is really going to uh, reduce time for migrations that involve these types of SQL stored procedures and help with our customers in moving more of their data and more of their workloads into the Snowflake platform. So if you think about it and, and really combining these new features with the data cloud story, with developers now having the ability to reduce the time for collection, not only within an organization, but from third parties and from partners, vendors, customers, and centralizing that using the Snowflake data shares and, and the data exchange. The ability to augment that data with our third party, as I mentioned, we have over 400 data sets across really all industries and is really growing at, at a tremendous rate. Um, one of the announcements we made is we're also looking to help organizations monetize through our data exchange as well, opening up more opportunities and more ways to get value out of your data. And all of this being uh, able to be used across structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data in their raw format immediately upon being brought into the Snowflake environment without any predefining the schemas and or any uh, engineering to take advantage of specifically uh, objects such as JSON or XML. And while I don't go into a deep the, uh, uh, areas and really um, talk about this in great detail, I, I don't wanna miss out on the opportunity to talk about a lot of the new areas around governance and security that we have introduced to the platform, starting with knowing your data. We've made announcements about automatic data classification and object tagging with inside of Snowflake protecting your data, especially at that fine grain level with row access policies and data masking policies that are now either generally available or public preview. Um, the announcement that we're gonna be doing conditional masking. So the ability to mask one column based off of the value of another column inside of Snowflake. And then expanding our rich set of metadata 
that is instantly available either through views or through our functions, now including the ability to not only see what tables users are accessing, but also the fields those users are accessing to give even more insight to how your data is being used and if it's being used appropriately. And we have a site specifically for developers that was launched last year. So if you're not aware of it, I encourage you to go out and take a look, but it's developers.snowflake.com and has a lot of information and resources specifically for the developer community. So um, I'd encourage all of you, if you had time, really get more information, a lot of different use cases, stories, technical material to help developers as they start looking to build uh, data intensive applications on the Snowflake platform. And we don't do this alone. We have a very large uh, partner technology ecosystem, and I have just a few of them up here across a lot of different areas. And these are partners that could be several years old. Some of them are new um, within the last year or two, but all of them have certified Snowflake connectors, which means it's gone through an independent uh, verification and, and that they're following best practices with inside of Snowflake. So um, whether, whether an organization is looking to do this through custom type applications or code, or really want to utilize technology partners that they're very happy with and, and comfortable and getting value out of, Snowflake wants to be an open environment, allowing our customers to interact with the platform in the way that they choose to be most appropriate and efficient and productive for them. And, and with the announcement of Snowpark, and Java UDFs, we have a new site also out there called Snowpark Accelerated. And we have a number of our technology partners that have put white papers and blogs and videos and how they're incorporating these new features into their products and how they've already gone about helping our mutual customers benefit from these new features and really gain even more value from the Snowflake platform itself as we look to, to look to expand what the Snowflake environment can do and what our customers are asking for the platform to be able to do as we move forward. The last topic that I'll, I'll uh, mention before we go to Q&A is a new group that was announced called Powered by Snowflake. And what Powered by Snowflake is, is uh, a department set up within inside of Snowflake to help our customers who are building applications on top of Snowflake. We had Adobe speak at our summit last month and really talk about um, how our platform and their applications built on top of Snowflake is benefiting their customers. BlackRock, one of the largest financial institutions, has built or is building their Aladdin application on top of Snowflake. And Snowflake is working with them through this Powered By team to do a number of things, including helping them build the products faster, better, using best practices with our architect teams, our product teams, working with their architect and product teams, the support they need to grow their business and making sure that Snowflake has their customers' backs and making sure that all the support and attention they need for these applications that are business critical to our customers are getting the attention that, that they need and deserve to make sure that the Snowflake platform and the Powered by Snowflake applications they're building really give benefit to all of the different uh, elements that they're introducing to their organizations. So with that, I'll stop and kind of pause, Pierre, and, and kind of turn it back to you and see if there's any comments, questions, or, or just conversations that we can discuss. Absolutely. Uh, so we do have a few questions we got uh, during, the, during the presentation. I think I start with one that came in just a little bit a little bit after you talked about it. Um, so you were discussing the Java UDFs. Is it possible to publish Java UDFs on the, mar the Snowflake marketplace at the moment? Not right now, um, we're doing other things to do that, but right now the Java UDS are actually executed on the platform that they're deployed on. So with the data share, the actual compute is being run on, on that customer's one. So we don't have that in place for data sharing cross, but it is on our roadmap. Excellent. Um, another, another interesting one, um, actually another, another fairly technical one maybe we could cover as well is, um, there's a question asking, is SQL and SQL-based stored procedures compatible with any of the traditional SQLs? So PL SQL, T SQL, and all of that. Um, there's some things like Oracle, we, we don't have a decode statement, but the SQL inside of Snowflake is 100% ANSI compliant. So in terms of that, the, the, the kind of the syntax and how we go about it, I'm sure it's gonna have differences and nuances from like a PL SQL or, or a transact SQL. But in terms of actually executing SQL and all of the functionality in SQL, yes, we are 100% ANSI compliant. Cool. 
Um, and here's a, here's a little bit more of a, a more um, open one. Are you able to share uh, some unexpected or interesting solutions customers have come up um, that kind of go beyond the traditional data warehousing or BI solutions like uh, these cases that were a little bit out there that you've seen? Um, they're not so much new to me because I've heard about it, but over the last six months, one of them that's really gained popularity is um, security analytics and putting that in a data lake. Um, we, we, we are not a SIM compliant. We have partners that have the same mindset and strategy in terms of, of how we go to market, but more and more customers are moving their security analytics to Snowflake because of the low cost of storage, because of the elasticity, because of the per second pricing. And um, we've had some rather large customers who have started off in the data warehouse have moved over to that area. And um, like I said, it's not necessarily new to me, but I don't know how many in the Snowflake community would think of Snowflake as a SIM solution, incorporating our, our, our partners like Hunters with the Snowflake platform to really have a compelling and cost-effective solution. Yes, I, I believe you've uh, you've secured a partnership recently with um, Secure Tronic. Is it possible? Something like that. Um, uh, the name, the name, uh, the name eludes me. Oh, well. Um, so uh, the other one would yeah, so the other one would be is we just got a patent on a data clean room, and it, it's kind of the the idea of the data sharing but taking these double blind joints for things like the MarTech industry or people going through mergers and acquisitions where data has to remain sensitive, but there needs to be a collaboration and the time and effort to get that in place. Um, it, it's really one that, like I said, we started working with some high profile customers and uh, we now have a patent and it is really an elegant solution for those types of, of customers that are collaborating with PII or other sensitive data that has to remain that way and has to have the confidence that it's being secured. That's actually a super interesting uh, design pattern. Maybe maybe we could speak a little bit more to it in case people aren't uh, aware of what data clean rooms are. Sure. Um, and and while uh, you know we, we have a YouTube video out there where Hulu and Disney talk about their streaming services and and the collaboration and how they need to exchange data and and really collaborate together but not share personal information. So, you know, they can't know that Jim lives in Chicago and, and does certain things, but knowing the fact that I like watching action adventure type movies would be beneficial. And being able to exchange and collaborate on that high level aggregation of data without giving sensitive information such as my phone number or my name or you know social security number when you're going to the nth extent. The ability to have that collaboration and gain value out of that relationship without endangering any of the privacy or, or um, strategic data that organizations want to keep within their four walls and obviously very, very secure and private. Right, right. So, so in concrete terms, when we're talking about a data clean room, we're talking about um, a, way, a way to share data, basically comparing values, uh, but not exposing them to each other party until, uh, unless there's a match, correct? Yes. And, and not only the data, and while we don't have the Java UDFs, we are having the ability to um, exchange code. So like there are functions that we can use that will be utilized where the code will be obfuscated to kind of the underlying logic, but the data share can run those functions and get the transformations or the logic in the data that they're passing into the table on the share or the view and get those result sets back. So we are looking to, to not only share data, but share the, the, the uh, uh, logic more or less to be able the to do logic. certain things, but not necessarily share proprietary information that, that would not uh, be beneficial, but allow the benefit of the results back to the sharing party. That's, that's super interesting. Um, we, we have a few other questions. Let's try to hit them all uh, before we go too deep into another topic. Um, what do you see as the core use case for the new SQL API? Really, it's uh, customers that are building applications and wanting to be able to have that elasticity and, and be able to handle spikes in demand, um, not having to load the driver in there where if they have an application that needs some data inside of Snowflake to be able to call out simply using the API and knowing that whether it's, it's 10 people hitting it at the same time or expanding out to 1,000 people, Snowflake's elasticity and its architecture are going to be able to do that. And it's a very simple process to start utilizing the assets uh, by, by using a method that is, is you know, pretty common and, and uh, used in virtually all companies with their applications today. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we have another one uh, that that's touching um, that's touching uh, the the Java execution inside of Snowflake. So, are there any limitations on the libraries that can be used in Scala or Java? There are certain libraries. Um, I I have to get you the list to refer back to uh, kind of the information on what libraries are can be used. Um, there are some limitations in libraries that would do things such as networking, where we don't allow things to go outside of the Snowflake tenant, and that's for security reasons. We're taking a very um, cautious view that we don't want to introduce anything that would potentially uh, raise a, not only a security risk but a security question. So doing things in those Java UDS that try to go outside the Snowflake tenant would, would not be permissible, for example. Excellent. Um, here's another one, a little bit more uh, open-ended question. And th this, is, this is a little bit more of a you question. Um, so what do you see as the, uh, seeing the direction Snowflake is taking, uh, taking on more and more diversity in its services? Um, what are you the most excited to see happen inside of the Snowflake platform to enable new use cases? Like if you look to the horizon, what is one thing that is not there currently that you see that may, that may come uh, relatively soon or you know, further away in the future and that will really uh, make a big difference? Taking this idea of the data cloud and, and really expanding it where we're, we're working now with ServiceNow and with um, Salesforce and the ability to query that data inside of Snowflake in their environments. And, and this content piece where, I don't know if you guys have seen, but there's a section on there where you can spin up um, technology partners applications such as, you know, Matillion or Tableau. Think about our customers having their applications in there where a BlackRock can have the Aladdin application and you're inside a Snowflake, you simply click a button. Behind the scenes, all the configuration, all the setup, all the work is done instantaneously where you're getting value out of that within a matter of seconds or minutes. And now uh, being able to, to take advantage of this without having to spend a lot of time planning and setting up, we're gonna be able to, to work with our customers and our partners to be able to add that content, that collaboration where it's not just data, it's the content around it and the ability to enable using it quickly, reducing a lot of the overhead and processes that traditionally were costly, time consuming, and sometimes ineffective. And, and having those best practices consistently applied through for these mechanisms. So that's kind of a longer term thing when you think about the Snowflake story and you can kind of see how we've gone from the warehouse to the platform, to the content. And now with this powered by Snowflake really having that true partnership with our customers and, and really benefiting from each other's uh, expertise and, and um, collaborations. That's very good. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely super interesting. And, you know, I think that uh, especially with the way Snowflake is evolving to become kind of this, um, this alternative answer to the problem of data gravity, right? Uh, where you, whenever you try to have a relatively diverse platform, now and nowadays, you know, you, you see more and more uh, multi-cloud strategies being adopted by larger enterprises, and moving data around becomes a significant problem. Snowflake being kind of this uh, this middle ground, this middle ground, this lingua franca, um, certainly puts it in a great position to enable a lot of those data sharing use cases and being able to actually go the best of breed way on the different cloud service providers um, and, and leverage that ecosystem that's building around Snowflake. So that's a uh, the, the, that's really promising from, from where I'm standing. Yeah, and not only the multi-cloud for an organization, what are the odds that you're gonna be dealing, interacting with customers and vendors and suppliers that are on the same cloud as you or use the same services that you do or in the same manner? Um, with Snowflake, we're enabling that and bringing that all together in that consistent um, way to do things and not having to spend weeks or, or even longer to set up FTPs or APIs or, or work it out. It's a matter of seconds. Um, and, and you're able to have these, these shared databases at your disposal with the full power of the Snowflake platform behind it. That's, that's, that's a very interesting notion. How, how easy it is, it is, is it uh, nowadays to kind of communicate that to customers? Because that's a very, a very new way to think about things, to really think about uh, data sharing at the literally at the infrastructure level, whereas in the past it's always been kind of this um, a little bit more involved, like API exposing, and like there, there there was more work and more concerted effort that was going into this. Now it's just this notion of hey, so we have this data already at the ready and just sharing it out. Um, yeah. What are the challenges you're seeing uh, in communicating that out? It's six months to a year ago, people didn't really understand the concept and um, slides didn't do us justice. We really had to do uh, use cases and prove it out and show 
that it literally could be done in a matter of 15, 30 seconds and set it up. Um, now, and you saw by that slide with the data cloud and the explosion, specifically over the last six months, where we have companies like NBC Universal and Kraft, and, and um, we just announced with Chipotle, these large companies and these, these press releases that they're working with us, that they're doing these types of things on the platform. So it's getting more and more out there. And, and the ability to demo this live and, and show customers, it, it kind of gives them a little bit of the, wow, do you, we know, you know what we could do? And, and what my goal is, quite honestly, is to set high expectations. And then when you're working with, with partners such as yourself and the sales teams, that you guys exceed the expectations that I'm setting today, because that's how confident and, and, and where we feel not only in the direction, but what the platform can actually do for customers to help them with their problems. And once again, help them think about what the possible now is. Definitely. Definitely. And, and that, that's, I think, one of the most exciting things when it comes to you know, how how we're approaching customers nowadays and are now referring you know, at, at Infostructs being dedicated to Snowflake and kind of coming into the conversation with, with these ideas, like these new notions that we're now kind of opening our customers' eyes to, right? Like making them realize that, hey, there's so much more that's possible now. Um, and you, 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 can, you kind of have to get them to start thinking a different way. And it's always it's always very exciting to see them kind of realize the potential and go, oh yeah, that's that's actually very cool, right? Like there's this little moment that's just uh, makes it worth it. Um, we have another question that came in. Uh, do we have, uh, do, so do you have any plans to extend Snowflake to support training models? Um, or perhaps have you seen instances where this is already done through the Java UDF Snowpark setup? Yeah, the training models are on the roadmap. Um, the first step we had was the jar files where after the, the models rendered, we're deploying that to Snowflake. Right now, we do work um, primarily with our partners in the training aspects. So that part is still done outside of Snowflake. Um, we're looking to see where we can do more and more of that. But like I said, we're, we want to be an open environment and have a lot of great uh, ML partners that, that really uh, sync up extremely well and take advantage of Snowflake and then utilize their, their algorithms and their technology to complement us very well for the machine learning part of it, the training part of it. Very cool. Yeah, I, I know for, for instance that right now you are leveraging uh, direct pathways between Snowflake and some of the cloud service providers, uh, machine learning services to cover that, that aspect of things, correct? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, I see that we are nearing the end of our time together. Uh, we have covered most of the questions that were sent our way. So uh, maybe at, the, at this point in time, uh, would you have a few parting words uh, for us and for our, our audience? Um, once again, just thank you guys for the opportunity to, to present to you guys. Um, we're really excited about this announcements with Snowpark and the Java UDS and combining that with all of the data that's now being uh, available to developers, not only inside their organization and outside the organization. And uh, I would encourage everybody, you know, if, I, if I've kind of, uh, you know, set expectations high, I've kind of whetted your appetite, reach out uh, to, to folks like Pierre and talk to them. Um, really get some more in depth. There's a lot of features we haven't covered. There's a lot of areas that we can talk about specific use cases. And, and you know, you know, really what my ask is as a customer, former customer, and now obviously love working with the company is um, let, let, let's see where the ideas and where those expectations can be set and then let us surpass them. Very cool. All right. Well, let's uh, take this as a call to arms then. Great. Well, thank you guys again for the invite and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Well, thank you for your time.